Good evening. I'm calling to order the April 25th, 2006 meeting of the Cape Elizabeth Planning Board. Uh, the first order of business is a review and approval of the minutes from our prior meeting of March 21, 2006. Are there any comments on those minutes? Do I have a motion? Barbara. So moved. There's a motion to approve the meeting Second. minutes, and it's been seconded. All those in favor? Motion carries. <coughs> Correspondence before us tonight include the Town Council Conditional Municipal Acceptance regarding Spurwink Woods, a memorandum from the Public Works Director regarding Spurwink Woods, a letter from the Town Attorney regarding Spurwink Woods, a memo from the Town Manager regarding, regarding the Jordan Subdivision, a letter from T. Egan regarding the Elliott Private Access Way, a letter from C. Vaniotis regarding the Elliott Private Access Way, uh, the addition of zoning practice dated March of 2006. Uh, in addition, we have been presented tonight with a letter dated April 20th, 2006 from Paul Katsos at 33 Columbus Road and, and attached to that a signed petition regarding Spurwink Woods. Uh, and we have also been receiving over the last uh, few weeks since the last meeting of the planning board, uh, several emails and letters, and they're all part of the public record. If you want to ensure that your email has made its way into the public record, you're, you're welcome to follow up with the town planner. Each member of the planning board does receive those emails directly. If you send them to the town planner, we all get them and we all review them. Uh, we had suggested, or there had been a suggestion prior to tonight's meeting that we take business out of order as we anticipate that discussion of the Jordan subdivision might be uh, briefer since we're, uh, it's a more limited issue than the Spurwick Wood subdivision. So is there a motion for the board to consider on that, David? I move that, you, uh, that we review the Jordan subdivision first. Is there a second? Second. <clears throat> Any further discussion? All those in favor? All right, before we get to that item on the agenda, I do want to uh, express my appreciation to the zoning board, which was kind enough to switch evenings with us so we could have the room tonight uh, to ensure that we had a full attendance by all of the members of our planning board. Um, so without further ado, I would uh, turn to new business, the Jordan subdivision. Uh, the Jordan family heirs are requesting minor subdivision review of a three lot subdivision proposed off of Deer Run Road. The application will be reviewed for compliance with section 16-2-3 minor subdivision review and section 19-7-2 open space zoning provisions. At this point I would invite the applicant up to the podium to provide an overview of the project. Good evening, Mr. Chairman, members of the board. Thank you. I'm Bob McTaff with Mitchell and Associates uh, here representing the heirs of William and Ruth Jordan. And tonight is Penny Jordan, Scott Butterfield, and I believe that's Mr. your brother. I haven't met him yet. And <laughs> her sister, Carol. Uh, as a brief, since the last time we were here uh, at a workshop session, we've made a couple of minor changes to the plan that I'll ultimately go over. But I'll uh, walk you through the, uh, the location of the property. Uh, this is an aerial photograph that we've had the, uh, the boundary survey superimposed over so that we'll be able to provide you uh, a reasonable identity of the parcel itself. Wells Road is located on this boundary line. Spurwink is here. This is the active agricultural use for the parcel. The parcel. This is with the family homestead and the farm barn, the barn and the farm stand and some other outside buildings. This is an existing pond in this portion of the site here and the balance of the site is wooded. There are numerous farm roads that cut back through the fields and back into the wooded area. Uh, there is an existing private easement, uh, which is Deer Run Road, <coughs> off of Spurwink. It runs in along this boundary line here, back up to the corner of the parcel here. There's an existing 100-foot CMP power easement that runs through the parcel here, down through to an out parcel, that, or a portion, excuse me, a parcel owned by Central Maine Power. Uh, Verizon has a substation in this corner of Deer Run Road, and there are two residential lots that are served by Deer Run Road uh, here and here. Uh, there is existing uh, utilities underground right now. There's power, telephone, and cable that come up to serve these two lots here. There's a transformer. Uh, Verizon has indicated that they have lines up here, but would need just to run a new service line around to serve the proposed lots at the rear. Power is fine. Cable television is fine. 
It's an existing 8-inch uh, water main. There is a fire hydrant that was installed, and that's roughly in this location back in here. Um, abutting the property, you have Leighton Farm subdivision over here, and then a portion lot abut the, excuse me, abutting here is a uh, town open space. The proposal before you is for a three lot subdivision using your open space uh, provisions. Uh, the parcel, total parcel is 73.8 plus acres, uh, of which uh, we're proposing to take 5.72 acres to create the three lot subdivision. The orientation this is a little different, so just to get your oriented in terms of where the subdivision is to lay out. This is the pond area in here. The subdivision will occur here. Oh, excuse me. <laughs> Thank you. All right. I'll just bring it back around. Spurwink Ave is here. This is Deer Run Road that comes up presently now and stops at about this location. Um, what we're proposing to do is to expand the 30-foot wide easement, access easement for Deer Run and change that to a 50-foot wide right-of-way. Proposing a new 50-foot wide right-of-way to provide frontage for the three proposed lots. Utilities will be extended from the portion where they terminate here to bring public water up and across the front to serve the three lots. Since the last time we were here, the open space on the initial workshop session we had included the boundary for this being along the outer edge of the pond. Uh, that has been subsequently changed and looking at the lot configuration and the, uh, the heirs desire to preserve that portion around the pond to be remaining with the rest of the estate. Uh, so the outline for the open space follows along this boundary line here. This is the line along with the town's open space and latent farm. And the boundary line comes along this corner here cuts across the CMP power easement that's located here. We've gone through the density calculations uh, to determine the number of lots. And based on the standards using the open space, uh, the minimum lot required is a 30,000 square foot lot. The uh, proposed lot average is 29,460. The minimum open space requirement based on 40% open space is 2.3, 3.69 acres or 65% of the lot is being preserved as open space. Of your usable open space, which requires 33% of the uh, 2.3 is a requirement of 0.77 acres and 2.97 acres of the open space is being preserved or a total of 80% of usable open space. Uh, the open space will be retained by the heirs. It will not be owned by the actual lots individually or shared under an ownership by the, the, the three lots, which will be the grandchildren. The 50-foot wide right-of-way for Deer Run and for the proposed new right-of-way will also be retained by the family. The last time we were before the board, as far as the workshop was concerned, because we had waivers, which we'll get into, uh, there was concern uh, in terms of the right-of-way and who was going to maintain that right away where we had requested waivers not to make any improvements on Deer Run at this point and to uh, ask for a reduction of waiver, uh, standards on uh, the proposed new road. So those sections of the property will be maintained and retained as ownership by the heirs, including that portion of the open space. Uh, in the application, uh, the new roadway was identified as Pond Hockey Way. Uh, there were some miscommunications. We had talked to Chief Williams and we thought he said yes to Pond Hockey Way. He thought we said Hockey Pond Way. So we have, at this point, the, uh, the applicant is going to change it to Hockey Pond Way. However, we would like to reserve the ability, if they want to think about it a little more, we may want to change it. But right now, it would be Hockey Pond Way, and Chief Williams was fine with that in terms of that name. So I just wanted to clarify that. Uh, we had requested several waivers, uh, and I can go through those again, and then uh, if you'd like, I'll go through some of the staff comments and our responses to some of the staff comments. The first waiver we had requested was uh, for the construction standards uh, for the existing portion of Deer Run Road. 
Deer runs an existing gravel road. Uh, it varies in width from the narrowest point of 12 feet to 18 feet. The average width across the entire section of that is about 15. There are portions of this that are uh, where the grass has grown up along the edge. It has come actually up over the gravel, so in terms of delineating it, the road probably is a little bit wider as far as a gravel base is concerned. At this point, where it's only going to be serving the three lots, which are going to be the grandchildren, uh, the request is not to improve that portion of Deer Run. And at the workshop session and subsequently in Maureen's review comments, uh, in request for that waiver is to put a note on the plan, of which we'll work out the language with Maureen, uh, that restricts any further development of the property for any additional lots off of Deer Run, uh, that it would have to come back to the board and to address the uh, design standards of the roadway at that time. The other is the waiver of the design standards on Hockey Pond Way. We've requested it down to an 18-foot travel way with two-foot wide gravel shoulders on each side. Uh, and that was to uh, try and retain the character. Uh, it's still going to be maintained as an agricultural activity. Uh, the family wanted to preserve that character of the property, and that's why we're putting the lots to the rear. Uh, otherwise, there would have been an opportunity to put it down closer to Spurwinkle and Wells Road. Uh, but the desire to maintain that rural agricultural activity and continue the agricultural activity is the reason we've pushed it back to the rear. Uh, and based on the fact it's only three lots being served back there, we are providing the 50-foot wide right away, but the request is to reduce that overall width and uh, to have it maintained as a gravel road. The other waiver that we've requested is for the HHE 200 uh, submission for the septic design for each one of the lots. We had submitted as part of our package a letter from Mark Hampton, who was the site evaluator, and determined that there are passing site locations which are identified on the plat plan as to where a leach field can go. And we're basically requesting a temporary waiver of that until a building permit is sought. And at that time, the HHE 200 form with the design would be submitted. The other waiver that we had requested uh, was the demarcation of the right-of-way boundary uh, with survey pins rather than granite monuments. Uh, we had discussions with Bob Malley today. Uh, as we understand, he was, with our conversation, that he is willing to compromise whether or not we had to have pins and monuments in all corners as far as the granite. And what he's asked us to do is to put two granites at the Spurwink Road Avenue side to have one corner of Deer Run and Hockey Pond Way with a granite. A granite at both ends of the proposed new right-of-way adjacent to the farm field, and then two monuments on the end of the turnaround, the emergency turnaround. Uh, we discussed that with him today. He was fine with that, and the applicant has no problems with that particular issue. Uh, the other is the request for a waiver of the required street trees. Uh, again, going back to the applicant's desire to maintain the agricultural character of this property and therefore pushing everything back towards the wooded portion, their intent is to maintain the vegetated line along the road frontage in there while it may not be preserving trees within the actual right-of-way due to the construction requirements for grading and drainage in there. Their intent is to maintain that wooded buffer along that edge of the right-of-way. Uh, any activity in terms of planting trees on the opposite side uh, would interfere with the agricultural activity. Right now, the active fields come all the way back up to this corner in here, and they really do not want to have trees that are going to have an impact on the agricultural fields. So therefore, we're still requesting uh, a waiver of the, uh, the two trees per lot, or 40 feet on center. The other waiver was a temporary uh, waiver request, and that is for a PE stamp on the, uh, the grading plan. Uh, just partly due to coordination issues and getting our civil to put a stamp on this, we were, we were able to do that during the submission. And I spoke with Mr. Harding, and we had a letter uh, submitted to, to Steve, and he was fine with that. And then on the final plan, we will actually have our PE stamp uh, on that plan. Uh, another waiver that we're Adding to this tonight, it's based on another one of Mr. Harding's comments, is that under the town's provisions, a plat plan can't have a scale any less than one inch equals 40 feet. Our plat plan is one inch equals 60. Uh, and he's, in his comments, that we need to request a waiver of the board to allow us uh, the plat plan to be at a scale of one inch equals 60 feet. 
The other waiver request is for the stormwater management report. Uh, it is a minor uh, development. Uh, the stormwater, pretty much right now, the existing farm road that goes through here, everything sheet flows back down towards the fields. Uh, the proposed grading will help to control that flow and direct it so it's not being concentrated in any one location along the road, the, uh, the farm fields. It will be dispersed down into a riprap area of the plunge pool that will then dissipate out over the, uh, this vegetated corner of the farm field. Uh, those are the waiver requests. Uh, if you'd like, I can go and try and respond to some of staff comments uh, that we're reviewed if you'd like to at this point. Does that seem acceptable to the board at this point? Sure. Okay. Uh, in Maureen's letter, uh, again, it goes back to the street trees. Uh, we're still, as I said, requesting a waiver of that requirement. We'd really like the board to entertain that. Uh, as I said, again, maintaining as much of the vegetation on the lots themselves are going to provide that character in terms of maintaining a vegetated line along the street. Uh, it's not a case where you're going to want to clear cutting that frontage along there and then therefore not having any visible buffer uh, to the new home sites. The other comment, comment number two on Deer Run Road, uh, again, that was our waiver. And the note uh, in terms of any future development on Deer Run, we have no issue with that. And we were going to put a note together. And I wanted to wait until we met with the board first, and then we will work out the language of Maureen to have these actual specifics put onto the plan. I guess the reduction with that is, uh, in terms of the road, is an issue that we need to discuss with the board. The other is the monumentation from Public Works Director, of which I have gone over. Uh, open space, item five, the applicant's proposing to reserve the open space area uh, by the uh, adjacent to Leighton Farm. Maureen has requested the applicant to consider granting an additional easement that would connect to the town's open space. Uh, We've discussed this with the applicant, and the concern is this property is still going to be maintained as an active agricultural use, and with that, uh, granting public access over this parcel is a liability issue that they're very concerned with, and at this point do not feel as though they're willing to entertain providing a public access easement over this portion of the property. There were a couple of comments in Mr. Harding's that uh, I'll briefly touch on. Uh, one was the uh, requirement for the first 50 feet of roadway on Deer Run to be paved. Uh, I think it may have been some misunderstanding on my behalf during the workshop session because I'd indicated we would do 50 and then I was told it had been reduced. So it was probably my misunderstanding. Uh, but the first 50 feet will be paved on uh, Spurwink Ave. One of Mr. Harding's additional comments is to evaluate the existing culvert that runs under Deer Run uh, within the right-of-way of Spurwink Ave, and we will take a look at that, and if it's warranted, replace it at the time when the, uh, that section of the roadway is going to be repaved. Note number 16 on the boundary survey. Um, there was an issue when the boundary was originally done that the Kennedy property down here, there were actually three different deed descriptions. And there was a crossover of boundary lines, and we have taken care of that. Uh, there's a quick claim deed between the heirs and the Kennedy family. Uh, that has been corrected. That note should have been corrected on the survey plan, and that will be done. And a copy of the quick claim deed actually was submitted with our original application. Um, there are a couple of the housekeeping items that uh, Steve wanted to see on there in terms of some of the, uh, the road radii added to the plan, uh, discussions of putting a plunge pool at the end of uh, the outfall for the drainage. Uh, he made reference to the police chief in terms of whether or not stop signs would be required. We did have a discussion with Chief Williams today in addition to the road. Uh, name. He's asked that we put a stop sign at Spurwink Ave in Deer Run. And he's also requesting that we put one at the intersection between Deer Run and Hockey Pond Way. And that will be taken care of. Uh, there are a couple of the minor, again, uh, the size of the riprap and the outlet will handle that on the, the subsequent drawings. And then the, uh, the detail for the pavement section at Spurwink will add that to the plans. 
And then there were some questions in terms of the budget uh, estimates for the improvements and those items that are in that uh, comment we will take care of and we'll revise that accordingly and resubmit that for uh, Maureen and staff review. And I think with that, that's an overview of what the, the applicant is proposing and uh, happy to answer any questions. Okay, thank you. Uh, the first issue for the board to determine is completeness. Uh, and I invite any comments on that issue at this time. Perhaps we could deal with that by motion. Any issues on completeness? I, I had a question about the code. There was a number nine on Tom, on Steve's memo, said something about the code enforcement officer should comment on the HHE, HHE 200 forms. Did he ever comment on that? No, he didn't, but he's, he's used to getting them as part of the building permit application. My guess is he would have no objection to them being submitted at a later date. Just to follow on that point, although I don't think it relates to completeness, Maureen, as I understand it, the requirement of having it at the time of the application and the approval is so that we know that, in fact, you can put one on the lot rather than, I have no trouble deferring it till the building permit's issued, but I just, is there anything the applicant can let us know and maybe this is more to the merits of the application than completeness about, uh, you know, a preliminary view on whether we're going to have any problems putting them on the lot. There is a letter in our application from our site evaluator that okay. he has gone on and, as I said, he's shown test pits on each one of the lots where a leach field can be okay. installed. But the request was, and there are other areas on the lots that it can be done. In case those don't work out. Well, they would work, but it's depending on where the family decides to put the home. Sure. So there's some flexibility. Therefore, that's why the request is when right. they decide what they're going to build for home and when they go for the, the building permit at that time, that application would be submitted. Sure. Any other questions? We have a motion for the board to consider. Peter? I have a motion to the board for, to consider. I move that based on the plans and materials submitted and the facts presented, the application of the Jordan family heirs and minor subdivision review of the three lot Jordan farm subdivision located off Deer Run Road be deemed complete. A motion has been made and seconded. Any further discussion? All those in favor? Motion carries unanimously. Uh, Another issue for us to determine is whether a site walk uh, should be scheduled. Any thoughts on that? I think we should. Yeah, I, I, I would concur. Okay, I, I agree with that, Jack. Uh, anybody disagree or? <clears throat> okay, I think we should uh, plan on a site walk then. Okay. Uh, we typically do these on Saturday mornings first thing with it being Little League season, maybe uh, at eight o'clock. It should be all right. It shouldn't, shouldn't take too long. Mm. Yeah. David? With the uh, light coming in in the evening later, is it a possibility to do it like after 5 o'clock? I don't have a problem with Saturday, but I'm just throwing this out as a suggestion. No, I, think that's, I think that's well taken this time. This time of year, what do you think? Sure. What, what, what are people's preferences? Not Friday. Does applicant care? <laughs> Not Friday. <laughs> <laughs> Tuesday. <laughs> uh, I know I'm generally free on Saturday mornings at 8. Um, Saturday morning. Saturday morning's fine. Okay. Yeah, either way. Okay. What, sat what, what upcoming Saturdays would work? This Saturday is the 29th. Would that work for the applicant? It works. What about the rest of the board? Opening day. <laughs> but we'll, we'll need to be out of there. <laughs> well, it's we not that big a walk. No, I understand. I'm relatively familiar with it, but we're going to do it at eight. Hopefully, we'll at eight o'clock Saturday. I can do it earlier if you want. No, that's no. I did, I, I did one with my own planning board last week at six thirty for one of my board members, so we'd get to work. No. I'll never do that again. No. <laughs> okay. So it would be Saturday, April 29th, April 29th at eight a.m. and we will meet at the end of Deer Run Road. Is that that's probably the, the best place to meet. And when we say the, end, we the mean... The furthest end in from Spurwink up closer okay. to where. All right, great. Uh, and I assume we'll need to schedule a public hearing on this application as well. And that would be, Maureen, when? The 
depends on whether they get their May 16th. Okay. When would they, do they need to get their submission in? No, they're ready. They're ready to go. Okay. Okay. May 16th. Okay. Is it appropriate to address any of the various waivers and other issues that have been raised by the applicant at this time, or would people prefer more? I just, I just wanted to offer to the board, the Conservation Commission reviewed this application at their, let's see, it's April, so it's at their April meeting, and I haven't provided you with a copy of their comments yet, but I wanted it to be out there as soon as possible because it could affect the design of the project. Uh, the Conservation Commission is very concerned that most of Lot 1 and a portion of Lot 2 is included in the 250-foot RP1 buffer, and it's been their standard practice to recommend against including the buffer within lot lines um, because it tends to, you, you want to keep the buffer in a natural state, and when it's in a lot, people tend to want to improve the lot. Mm -hmm. And so I just thought I'd bring that up as soon as possible. I guess I had a question about how that open space is managed. Can things be, are things, how, uh, under what condition is that open space maintained? If it's, if it's with the heirs, then what is able to be done and not done there? Uh, the applicant would be required uh, prior to approval to come up with a management document. Uh, typically, open space is set aside and the public, the general public is allowed to use it and it's deeded to the town and so we get a deed. In this particular case, the applicants are proposing to retain ownership of the property, which they can do, and they're also proposing to limit use of the open space to the lot owners, also something they are legally allowed to do, but they have to put restrictions on the open space that keep it open, keep it natural, and the applicant would be required to prepare those restrictions for the town's review. Do any of our materials indicate where the 250-foot setback falls within the proposed lots one, two, and three? Or yes, it's on the yep. uh, sheet three of the plot plan. Uh, which I have it right open to, okay. And it shows the setback, the 250-foot. Okay. Falls right along here. So it's this portion of lot one and this sliver on lot two. Road improved. I'm sorry, what? Is that total road usable? Oh, yeah. Ms. Trump. Barbara? Am I reading this right, Bob? Is the building envelope just about the 250-foot? Yeah, the 250-foot becomes the outer limit of your, which would normally be like your side setback. That becomes the setback line for the building window. But this, it's that. This is the building. We're showing the 250-foot right. limit. That's where the, lot, the building envelope is. Yes, this is. The building envelope would be this portion, that's, that's what I like that. Okay. Has the applicant given any thought to amending the plans to not include the setback area within lot one? No. <laughs> We're talking about maybe that's a triple negative by now. Okay. Any board members care to comment on that issue? Not at this point. But okay. I mean, it's, it's out there. Okay. But I, I don't have enough information to. Yeah. I guess in terms of discussion. We'll take a look at that at the site walk. Yeah. yeah. One of the issues in terms of trying to reconfigure that, to take that out of that setback area, is it pushes the property further in this direction underneath the CMP easement. You can't construct anything within the CMP easement. CMP has restrictions in terms of what can occur. So in order to get the frontage and the developable portion of a lot, this configuration pretty much is set. Not much flexibility. We, excuse me. Will we get that those comments before the site work? Absolutely. Okay. okay. I assume I can have a fax copy of those, Maureen. Absolutely. Thank you. Yeah. I'd like to make a suggestion that we withhold further discussion and comment on the application until, the until we've had the site walk and the public hearing. We have another agenda item that's going to require a great deal of time. And is anybody? Oppose that idea. All right. Then, do we have a motion for the board to consider, Peter? I move that the uh, application be tabled to the regular May 16, 2006 meeting of the planning board, at which time the public hearing will be held. Motion been made. Second. Second. Any further discussion? All those in favor. Okay.
Harris. Thank, thank you. Thank you. See you Saturday morning. Would you send us a friendly email reminder <laughs> about the site walk? Sure. Yes. Sent a reminder. This should be a reminder. reminder on the site. I always remind it to send an email. Right? I just said. I did? No, I did. Okay, the next item on the You'll agenda under old business, Spurwink Woods LLC is requesting final subdivision review, a resource protection permit, and amendments to two previously approved subdivisions for Spurwink Woods. 42 unit subdivision proposed for the area between Dermot Drive and Kildeer Road. The application includes 19 condominiums and 23 single family home lots on 24.97 acres. The application will be reviewed for compliance with section 16-2-4 subdivision regulations, section 16-2-5 amendments to previously approved subdivisions, and section 19-8-3 resource protection regulations. At this point, I would ask the applicant to come forward and summarize any changes to the project since our last meeting. Okay, thank you. My name is John Mitchell, Mitchell and Associates, and I represent Spinwick Woods LLC. Um, what I would like to do before I go into the plan changes, as I've done in the past, I would like to uh, use the booklet um, as a format for our presentation and just go through this uh, briefly. Um, as you know, we received preliminary uh, subdivision approval on February 27th, uh, as well as a resource protection permit uh, preliminary approval with the following conditions. Number one, that the extension of South Street to the common property line with the Maxwell property, this area right here, uh, be deleted if the Town Council does not adopt the bisect bisected lot amendment. And number two, that the applicant hold a uh, meeting with the residents of the abutting neighborhoods to obtain their input regarding the traffic calming measures. On March 13th, uh, the Council adopted the bisected lot amendment. Therefore, the extension of the South Street to the Maxwell property uh, remains on the plan. And on March 22nd, uh, Mitchell and Associates and Goral Palmer, um, Goral Palmer Consulting Engineers held a, a traffic calming neighborhood meeting here at the town hall. So we have met those two, uh, two conditions. On page two of my cover letter under permit summary, uh, this is just to present to the board uh, what permits have been submitted to uh, state agencies, state and federal agencies, um, as well as the permits that we've already received. Uh, we have, uh, there is a total of four permits that have been submitted. First, the stormwater law permit, which was originally submitted in October 28, of 28. Uh, the revised stormwater uh, management plan was submitted last week. The notice of intent went in with the stormwater law permit on October 28th. Uh, the NRPA permit was submitted on December 8th. 
and the permit by rule was submitted on uh, December 8th also. And we have received the permit by rule permit uh, on December 22nd, and we've also received the Army Corps of Engineers permit for the wetland. Under traffic calming measures, uh, as I said, on March 22nd, we held a uh, traffic calming meeting with the abutting neighbors, uh, neighborhoods. Um, and uh, following my presentation, Tom Goral of Goral Palmer is going to present um, the traffic calming measures. On page three, uh, there were, at the last planning board meeting, uh, there were a few items that were mentioned or asked by the planning board uh, that we addressed in, in this submission package. The first was the shared driveways uh, for uh, these lots up here for two, three, four, and five have been shown on the plan. Uh, they are also incorporated in the legal documents as part of this application. Uh, a note has been added to the plans. This was requested by one of the board members uh, to expand on the note number four of sheets two and five regarding Franklin Circle. In that note, uh, the added uh, language to that note includes, should the proposed alignment be inadequate, the contractor shall build Franklin Circle to standards required by the Public Works Director. If you remember, this is a waiver that we're requesting for Franklin Circle. And uh, Mr. Godfrey asked us to review the driveway location for lot 13. Uh, we have done that, and that is located right here. Uh, we have reviewed uh, the driveway location for that lot, and there is adequate space uh, to provide that driveway. The following paragraph, uh, under amended subdivision plans, uh, we continue to include uh, our, the two amended subdivision plans in our final submission package. Uh, this is for the South Portland Estate subdivision uh, and the Mitchell Highlands subdivision. And uh, we require, or this, this, these amendments are required because we're adding land, uh, we're taking away land from those two subdivisions and adding land to the Springwick Woods subdivision. So those two abutting subdivisions uh, have to be amended. And those plans can be found under uh, Exhibit 10 of this booklet. We are, uh, at this time, Springwick Woods is uh, anticipating to, to be developed in three phases. And I've outlined the three phases uh, on this plan here, and this is also included in your packet. Um, phase one, um, which is outlined in red, which will include the open space, um, and South Street, uh, Lots 1 through 13 will be included in phase 1, as well as all of the open space will be deeded to the town at that time. Phase 2 includes Franklin Circle, this area right here, which includes lots 14 through 23. And phase 3 includes the, the remainder of South Street and the development of uh, the condominium project. Uh, pages four through nine of my cover letter are, are basically our responses to uh, the comments that were provided by uh, Tom Errico of Wibble Smith Associates and Steve Harding. Uh, I will, unless the board wants me to, I'll pass over these. These are fairly technical in nature. Um, all of the comments have been addressed um, either um, by this narrative here or on the plans. Under the submission <coughs> on page 9, the submission items, uh, very briefly, uh, section 1 includes the uh, conditional municipal approval that we received from the Town Council on March 29th, and this is for the 
uh, for the public roads, for the open space, and for the easements of, the, of, this, of this development. Section 2 uh, contains five legal documents, five different documents, um, and I believe that these have been reviewed and approved by, by Michael Hill. Uh, the first is a quick claim deed for the open space. The second, second document, uh, which runs from pages 1 through 6, is a deed uh, of conservation easement, and this is for the open space. The third item uh, runs from pages 1 through 7, and this is the declaration of easements, restrictions, and covenants for Spearwick Woods, and that would be for the single family home lots. The fourth legal document runs from pages 1 through 28. This is the declaration of condominium the, uh, for the cottages of the Cape. Um, And then the last legal document are written descriptions, deed descriptions, uh, the, the meets and bounds for the roads, the right of ways, and the open space. In section three is a draft letter uh, in the form of a irrevo irrevocable letter of credit for Spearwick Woods LLC from Bank North, uh, as well as a uh, a detailed cost estimate for each of the three phases. Under section four, uh, we have submitted uh, our final plans to the Portland Water District. They sent back their comments. We've revised our plans and sent them back to the Portland Water District and we're waiting for their final uh, sign off on the water design. Uh, but we've also included the letter uh, from the Portland Water District indicating uh, capacity, adequate capacity. Under Section 5 is a memo from Bob Malley uh, regarding acceptance of our sanitary sewer system. Section 6 is a copy of the uh, Army Corps of Engineers approval for the wetland fill. Under Section 7, um, this this, uh, this section is, uh, has to do with the traffic calming neighborhood meeting that we had on March 22nd. Um, and there are several exhibits within this section. Um, and I'm going to let Tom Gorrell uh, in his presentation review those. Uh, section 8 is a letter from uh, Gorrell Palmer, consulting engineers, regarding the traffic calming uh, meeting. And under Section 9 is a, uh, I'm going to let Tom review this also, but this is a graphic that we included for the Columbus Kildare Road neighborhood uh, that shows some proposed traffic calming measures. And the last section, uh, two uh, reduced copies of the uh, abutting neighborhoods that include the uh, amended subdivision plans. And under uh, item 11 uh, in my cover letter is a list of plan revisions that we have made since our last planning board meeting. I'll just review those. Uh, the first is we have added a subdivision plat plan. This is the plan that will be signed by the planning board and recorded at the registry. Uh, this basically is, is a copy of the plat plan and it does show the, the three phases. Um, it also has all of the meets and bounds for all of the lots, for the open space, for uh, the right of way, for easements. We have added the shared driveways for lots two, three, two and three, and four and five. We've added a, the driveway off of lot 11 onto Chicory Way. We've added a sign. Uh, at the end of South Street, um, that will be in this location here, that reads uh, private road, residents only. We've added a sign at the uh, turnarounds that say no parking. We added the note for Franklin Circle that I, that I read to you. 
uh, and we've moved uh, level lip spreaders number six and seven out of the condominium area. Uh, there are two level lip spreaders here that were located within the condominium area. We've just taken those and shifted them so that now they're in the, um, uh, the open space of what will be the town, uh, town land. Uh, let's see, at this point, I'm going to ask Tom to, uh, to present uh, the traffic issues, and then I'm going to uh, return for some final notes. Mr. Chairman and members of the board, I'm Tom Goral with Goral Palmer, and as John said, um, at your meeting on February 27th, when you gave preliminary approval, one of your conditions was that the applicant meet with the neighborhood um, to gain their input on traffic calming and what they would like to see potentially in their neighborhood. And that meeting did take place um, on March 22nd, as John said, and was, a team, uh, was attended by approximately 31 people. Uh, plus the applicant, uh, John, and myself. Um, we gave an introduction. Uh, it took place in this building. We then went over a um, detailed PowerPoint presentation that presented uh, various traffic calming devices, not advocating any of them anywhere, but simply um, essentially going over what each one would be and what that particular device uh, tries to accomplish and what the advantages and disadvantages of it are. And we also um, had taken a photo um, actually on Columbus and then superimposed what each one of these would look like. So you had a, a visual there as well, which obviously the picture is worth a thousand words. And I think that's really true because people, um, I think, had some different opinions when they saw some measures that they might have been in favor of. Um, maybe they weren't so much anymore and perhaps vice versa, so it was a pretty useful tool. Um, the following that in kind of a question and answer period about um, each one of those, we broke into two groups um, and those two groups basically represented the Hamlin Stevenson Street neighborhood and the other group was the Columbus Street neighborhood. And it really was an opportunity for each person to give their opinion on what traffic measure, they, traffic calming measure they would like to see. And we started with, uh, you know, and went around the room with each person uh, for three, four minutes each. So everyone that was there uh, spoke about what their preference was. And we asked them to order their preference so that when they spoke, they would um, give their first, second, third, and fourth choice and explain uh, why. We also um, asked them to fill out a survey that pretty much did the same thing, um, again, just for our records. Following that, we reconvened the groups and we uh, gave a summary of the findings of each group or the opinions of each group, and uh, then uh, that concluded the evening. We did keep detailed notes, and I think uh, copies of those notes have been, been furnished. And I think a copy of the PowerPoint presentation, I think, was included in the packet as well. Um, so in terms of the first choice, it was far and away, um, in fact, it was unanimous that everybody was interested in a gate. Um, they wanted to see the gate uh, pretty much on South Street, immediately east of Chicory Way, uh, Way at the proposed uh, trail location. And the reason was they thought it would sort of um, result in an access to the proposed condominium, condominiums and lots 10 through 13 being uh, to Mitchell Road and the remaining lots being accessed from Spurwick. Um, so it sort of divides the traffic, if you will, if you had the gate in. We've looked at that and in detail, and, and frankly, as I've um, indicated to you folks before, we're not at all in favor of the gate. My office certainly is not in favor of the gate. We spend a good deal of time advocating today for neighborhood interconnectivity. That's the, also the position of the state planning office and other 
agencies uh, looking at land development today, then that they feel that we've made mistakes in the past and that really we need uh, neighborhood interconnectivity. Obviously, um, I mean, the benefits to that obviously are, you know, to the overall roadway system are uh, essentially reduced vehicle miles traveled, um, which we're all concerned about today, reduced congestion, and it also improves res emergency response times. There's many other benefits as well. Clearly, the disadvantage to that um, is that it does put more traffic in your neighborhood. And as we went through in detail at the last meeting, uh, there's a potential for some cut through traffic, but we didn't feel that there was a lot of potential for cut through traffic. There, if you put in a gate, you clearly eliminate the possibility for the interconnectivity between those existing neighborhoods. You'll recall that we had a good deal of traffic that we would see from the Columbus Street neighborhood, for instance, that might go out towards Spurwink, and vice versa. So those neighborhoods themselves, without cut through traffic, would have different travel options. Obviously, what they're going to choose is the routes that's shorter and more convenient for them, thus cutting down vehicle miles traveled over what they would otherwise do in that neighborhood. So we did a very detailed look, see, at the uh, cut through traffic and presented that at our last meeting. And it was our conclusion that there would not be a lot of cut through traffic. We concluded there'd be about 25 trips in a peak, uh, trip ends in a peak hour. Obviously, that's more traffic, you know, than you have going through there today. Um, Tom Erico did the peer review and he concluded essentially that the he concluded with the methods and conclusions and indicated that he felt there'd be some cut through traffic, but in his professional opinion, the amount would not be significant. Um, he based that conclusion, obviously, on the layout of the proposed uh, project, where you do have, obviously, a roadway that's approximately 22 feet curb to curb and has a curvilinear nature to it and has stop signs and the like and, and some uh, race crosswalks proposed. So it's really designed to make it inconvenient for the cut through traffic. So having though listened to the neighborhood, um, which we clearly want to do as much as possible, but we need to balance that against good transportation policy, we um, felt that an appropriate uh, recommendation would be that we um, do not put in the gate unless um, through a study afterwards it's found that we're way off on our uh, estimate of cut through traffic, which is what this concern is about. We estimated uh, that we'd have a total of 25 trip ends cutting through uh, during a peak hour. And if, mm. if that turns out to be greater than that, then uh, the gate could be considered. And so we've recommended th that threshold, and we've recommended that a study be done maybe 12 months following that, so that if it's what we're forecasting or below, which is what Tom Erico also agreed with, then um, we don't have an issue. There's no reason to have a gate, and we have the benefit of the neighborhood inter interconnectivity. So that's um, how we concluded that one. The second, uh, well, the second and third choice were somewhat blurred, I guess, in my opinion. They were pretty close to tied. But for the second choice, anyway, I'll present the um, reduced roadway width with an esplanade and sidewalk. And a reduced, uh, or a sidewalk without a reduced roadway width is really not going to, at least in my opinion, reduce the travel speeds by a heck of a lot. Uh, it really won't be measurable. If you do reduce the roadway width, though, um, Typically, you do um, have a reduction in the vehicle uh, speeds by somewhere around three miles an hour, that, uh, that neighborhood. And so um, it, they, they were also talking about the, uh, the five-foot esplanade with a five-foot sidewalk. So we've looked at that closely. And part of the concern that was expressed, too, though, was some of the impacts that that has. Even though it's, it's in the right-of-way, there's obviously a feeling that um, when you're doing that, that that's in somebody's front lawn. So that was a bit of concern. 
Uh, frankly, the other, uh, besides the disruption to the adjacent properties and drainage impacts and that sort of thing, um, it is quite expensive as well. So the applicant, after considering that, has not uh, included that as part of the traffic counting plan. The third choice, um, which is um, the installation of stop signs, and I think it, <coughs> excuse me, might have been the second choice, but that um, everybody was very strong on putting in uh, stop signs. As a traffic engineer, <clears throat> we have to be kind of careful that we don't overdo stop signs because we want to maintain respect for stop signs. If people begin to disregard stop signs because they're too frequent, then that's an issue. So we have to be careful about where we put them. So we've done that, and we had originally recommended stop signs at Dermot Drive, Franklin Circle, and Chicory Way. And based on the neighborhood meeting, um, oh, and we also had one at Kildare. Um, we did uh, recommend one at Kildare and Columbus um, as well. The fourth choice of the neighborhood, again, this was fairly close in the ranking system, was landscaping. You'll recall, I think, through our last presentation that landscaping has uh, certainly a benefit in slowing down the traffic. Um, sort of creates side friction, if you will. People understand the neighborhood, and it's just having things closed in a little bit more on you. You tend to slow down. So it's similar to the, the narrowing in that you're going to get probably something like a three mile an hour reduction um, with that. And so we were recommending that trees be installed uh, along uh, both sides of Columbus every 40 feet or so um, at an appropriate location. That was the top four choices. There were some other uh, traffic calming measures that were discussed, um, and they did not support speed bumps didn't support speed tables within those existing neighborhoods. Uh, although there was some support for a uh, speed table, um, or hump, I'm not exactly sure, going down uh, Hamlin Street. We looked at that, but Hamlin Street's only about 700 feet long. And it, it seemed to us, putting one in the middle, um, while it could be done, Hopefully, it's kind of hard to get up to much more than 25, you know, you're going 350 feet and then you should be thinking about stopping again at the next intersection. So we didn't see there was a big benefit to putting uh, a speed table at that location. But that was the only location that uh, I think there was a, a consensus on that. Um, we had talked in our original traffic calming plan about installation of chicanes. And I think you'll recall chicanes are sort of alternating bump outs. Um, and they give you the opportunity to put in landscaping. And they restrict the visual corridor looking down the roadway. Obviously, Columbus Road's pretty straight, and um, so you get the straightaway effect. Um, but I think probably somewhat as a result of, of the PowerPoint and, and showing the photo rendering of what it would look like, People had a different impression of it, so they decided that wasn't something that they wanted to see. So we, did, we eliminated that from the traffic calming plan in favor of the multi-way stop sign that um, talked about earlier. Um, additional comments, I think, on the traffic calming plan was the uh, Hamlin Street neighborhood wanted to see uh, South Street improved to town standards. Um, at this point, uh, we were really directing people down Hamlin. We really don't, or the applicant doesn't own uh, or control, really have the authority to improve as far as that goes. Um, aside from that, um, improving that obviously is just going to increase the traffic potentially in that neighborhood, as well as in Stevenson. Uh, uh, you would need to improve that as well if you're going to include uh, the other one. So you're going to have uh, an increase of traffic in that area. So we really, as John said, we're recommending just a private road, residence only sort of sign and have people uh, utilize Hamlin. Um, so I guess what I, just in summary, what our traffic calming plan seemed to emerge was um, that we have the 22 foot curb to curb width for the proposed sections of South Street and Chicory Way. Uh, we have a raised crosswalk on South Street at Franklin Circle. 
and we have stop signs at Dermot Drive, Franklin Circle, Chicory Way, and Kildare. We have a multi-way stop sign at Kildare Road in Columbus, halfway down Columbus Road in place of the chicanes that we had before. Um, we have the installation of trees on Columbus every 40 feet or so. We have um, also, again, recommended that a cut-through study be done um, about 12 months after completion of an occupancy of about 75% of the project so that we can uh, monitor to make sure that the cut-through traffic doesn't exceed what we were estimating. And if it did, then we would look at the uh, gate which uh, the neighborhood was advocating. So with that, I'll turn that back to John. Thank you. So, um, in regards to completeness of the final submission package uh, and Marine's letter, the checklist uh, 1A and 1B, I believe, refer to the stormwater, uh, man the revised stormwater management plan. And uh, we have, and I believe you have in your packet, a letter from Steve Harding indicating that he has received the revised stormwater plans and that they are complete. Um, and then <clears throat> item, uh, item four, written evidence of required federal, state, or local permits is partially incomplete. Um, and I've reviewed with the board the status of those permits. Um, they've all been submitted, but we're just waiting for them to be uh, approved. And finally, uh, Steve Harding's letter, which was attached to Marine's memo. Uh, we basically have, uh, since we received this letter, we have gone down and addressed uh, both our firm and Goro Palmer has addressed each one of these items, and uh, the plans have been changed, revised, and they will all be uh, included on the next revised set of plans that we're going to submit on Friday. Okay, thank you. Thank you. At this point, the first issue for the board to consider is that of completeness. Are there any questions or concerns in that regard? If not, is there a motion for the board to consider? David? Well, actually, we don't have a public hearing scheduled for tonight. We are going to get to that issue very shortly. Well, I, I, th I think we'd like to deal with the issue of completeness first. We are going to actually, just as a preview of coming attractions for the people who are here tonight, uh, we are planning to go through one by one all the various traffic calming measures that have been proposed, either by the applicant or by members of the abutting neighborhoods, because we want to convey to both the applicant and the residents affected what the board's initial inclinations are with respect to each of the proposed uh, traffic calming measures. We also are going to talk about specific requests made by abutters uh, for buffering. We want to review that, that issue tonight. Uh, we also want to discuss another site walk tonight. I'm planning to get to that. Uh, and possibly we're, there may be a brief discussion about stormwater management. Um, so I Let me, let me, uh, I, I don't want to be the only one to speak to this issue, so uh, let me ask other members of the board their thoughts the on it. The chair thinks it's okay. I have, I have no trouble with I don't that. Know. So, I just don't want to open up a general discussion. That's my. Uh, the, the only concern I have is if I allow uh, right. Ms. Fernald uh, to speak, then I'm going to hear from the other 12 people, well, how come she got to speak and I didn't get to speak? And we ran into that issue, I'm afraid, at another public hearing where we allowed a member uh, I believe, of the town council to speak, and other members of those neighborhoods became extremely upset that they were ne then not given an opportunity to speak. So my inclination is to not go there. Uh, yeah, yet. Go ahead, she, Peter. No, yet, meaning she will have an opportunity to speak. I want, I want her. Oh, there's, it's going to be clear there will be an opportunity to speak at the public hearing that will be scheduled in May. Yes.
write to you ahead of time and didn't get a chance. So if it, if it is, before you were voting on completeness. I appreciate that. If it's limited to the issue of completeness, uh, and given that you and other members of your neighborhood have been very diligent about sending us emails, you didn't get to that issue today. If it's only on completeness, I'd be inclined to allow a few quick questions from you. Is that okay with other members of the board? Mm -hmm. That's fine. Okay. Would you step up to the podium, though, identify yourself, and tell us where you live? Thank you. Uh, my name is Becky Fernald, and I live on Mitchell Road. Uh, I just had a question on, I know there's obviously been a lot of um, um, study um, on the wetlands, but there is another wetland. Um, I was just going to bring that up. Pardon me? I was going to bring that up. Oh, there, there's another wetland. Um, it, it's in between Canterbury Commons, the condominiums there, and the, um, the site where the condominiums are planned. And I, I'm not sure if that particular wetland area has been reviewed. I think the focus has been more on the southern end of the property, if I'm not mistaken. Maybe, maybe I'm not correct on this. So I just want a clarification on that. Um, it's definitely a, a significant wetland. Um, there's skating, you can skate there in the winter, and um, at this time of year, it's full of peepers. <laughs> and, um, and the other issue, and, and so I just wanted to make sure that that had been reviewed. And I know the Conservation Commission had reviewed, asked to review the wetland piece of the application, but I don't know if that particular section was reviewed. Um, and the other issue is the issue of the vernal pools. Before you leave, can you just point to me the area on that drawing that you're talking oh, about? Gosh. I'm not really good at it. <laughs> okay. Condominium area would be in the area to the bottom right. right. These are wetlands. Yeah. Okay. Well, this is a condominium area right. in here. There are wetlands down here. That's off our property. Okay. But it, so, is, yes. but it affects those wetlands. So, so that, that's the area that you're referring to? Yes. Okay. It's a large wetland area down there. It's not on the property, um, but it's down slope. So definitely if you have buildings up above, it would affect those wetlands. So I, I didn't know whether that had been had been addressed. Okay. And, um, and the other issue was one that had been addressed earlier on, on, on vernal pools. And um, given all the publicity recently on vernal pools, I didn't know if that, that also had been um, addressed. And one other thing that I know has been raised quite a number of times, and I know um, Mr. Mitchell had mentioned that he would um, preserve some of the trees, but um, as Does related to completeness? Pardon me? Does this issue relate to completeness? Yes, because um, the, uh, I didn't see a designation in the uh, application about where, of uh, which trees would be preserved because as the ordinance states, every effort should be made to preserve trees of 10 inches or more in diameter and there are many trees that are 20 inches or 30 inches in diameter and I don't know if a survey was actually done to identify those trees. So. Um, those are, it was the, the uh, large tree growth, the vernal pools, and the additional wetland area. Thank you very much for letting me speak. <coughs> Does any member of the board care to comment on the issues raised by Ms. Fernald or otherwise? Barbara, I think you indicated you had a question. Well, no, about no, I, I have another question about completeness. Okay. <clears throat> and, and that is, there was a, one of the abutters asked for another study to be done about the stormwater runoff, and there has been no response that I can find to that. Now, I don't know how that affects completeness or whether it does. Is anybody, Maureen, would you care to comment on that? Yes, um, the applicant has completely redone their stormwater plan. And it's, it's the plans are sitting in my office and in, the, in Steve Harding's office. And so he's reviewing those now. Okay, so that, that would not affect completeness 
and not until the next time well, when we The letter that um, I handed out to you tonight, the one paragraph letter from OST Associates, Steve Harding, mm -hmm. states that he has received that package and he's done a level of review to determine it's complete. He just hasn't done a level of review to pick out all the little things he's going to find in it. And that does relate the two? Tonight's completeness. Okay. But that doesn't affect completeness. But it does relate the two stormwater plans, though. Not plans. There's one stormwater plan. But then there was another <coughs> The DeLuca Hoffman report. DeLuca. Yeah, I've, I mean, that's why that set of plans was done, because I told the applicant that they needed to go over their plans okay. and make sure that when they resubmitted their plans that any issue that was raised in that report that was relevant needed to be addressed in their plans. I've also forwarded a copy of the DeLuca Hoffman letter to Steve Harding and asked him to review the applicant's stormwater plans for all of those issues identified in the DeLuca Hoffman report. Fine. And that's this letter. Okay, thank you. David. Regarding the uh, trees, I think we will be addressing that at a later time. Uh, but I don't think that completely I don't think that affects the completeness at this point. Uh, and it's, it's one of the things that we look at on site walks. And other board members of the town planner can correct me if I'm wrong, but my understanding of completeness is that we are ensuring that all the parts of the application are before us, as opposed to whether or not we agree with what's in them and that we are inclined to approve of them. So when we say the application is complete, all we're doing is allowing it to go on to the public hearing stage, at which time we can review the merits. Uh, so I'll, although I understand the concerns, concerns raised by the, the comments tonight, I'm not sure they actually relate to the issue of completeness as opposed to the merits of the applicant. It doesn't, application, even, excuse it me. doesn't even mean that within the documents we do have that are complete, that they've addressed all the issues we might want them to address, meaning that's, that's what we're going to be discussing as we go forward with this. So it completely just means they've submitted everything they're supposed to submit as part of the package, uh, and our staff people feel that there's enough there to review. Is that a fair summary, Maureen? Um, the issue of trees of 10 inches or more in diameter is a submission requirement for preliminary subdivision okay. approval. And the applicant did not do an inventory. What they did is identified entire areas where they said all the trees in that area would be preserved and outside of that area trees would not be preserved. I see. And the planning board has previously accepted that, that presentation. Um, in the package you have tonight on page, the fourth page, is actually the checklist for final subdivision completeness. And those are the types, those are the issues that you are voting on for completeness for tonight's meeting. And you can see that there's no trees there. And, and my recollection, again, and maybe the applicant will correct me if I'm wrong, is that although they would make every effort to preserve existing trees in the area that would be built upon, there could be no guarantees made uh, given what's involved with construction <coughs> homes, but I do recall a discussion about the open space, that every tree within that open space would be preserved. Is that fair to say? Okay. Any further discussion on the issue of completeness? A motion. David, sure. Motion for the board to consider. Motion for completeness. Be it ordered that based on plans and materials submitted, and the facts presented, the application is Sperling Woods LLC for final subdivision review, <clears throat> a resource protection permit, and amendments to previously approved subdivisions for Sperling Woods, a 42-unit subdivision <clears throat> located between Dermot Drive and Kildare Road be deemed complete. Okay, we have a motion on completeness. Is there a second? Second. Seconded. Any further discussion? All those in favor? Opposed? Motion carries unanimously. Uh, the suggestion in the town planner's memorandum tonight was that we may want to begin some substantive discussion of the application. Uh, for a number of reasons, I think that's a good idea tonight. Uh, it, it is only 8.20, uh, and I'd like to try to take some time here to go through uh, the issue of the traffic calming measures that have been raised. Uh, as well as the individual requests that have been made for buffering by individual uh, residents. Uh, tied into that perhaps may be another site walk 
and then any other issue that any member of the board feels that we can raise tonight, I'd be happy to try to address that. A reason that I want to focus on what individual members of the board think about a certain traffic calming measure is so that members of these neighborhoods will have a preview of what we're inclined to want to see in a final plan or not. If, by way of example, every member of the board favored a safety gate that may change uh, the amount of preparation or emails or the subjects of the emails that you would need to send to us prior to the next hearing. On the other hand, if it were four to three or three to four, you'd know that there was a real issue and dispute among the board members so you could prepare and plan accordingly. <clears throat> um, with that being said, I'd, I'd like to begin with the traffic calming measures and it, it might be most useful to use as sort of a guide here tonight the rankings for the summary that Maureen prepared and I'm just going to see if I can find it. How, how, it, how it would work, this idea of not having the gate and counting the cars. I'm, I'm very reluctant to, <clears throat> eight years from now, have, unless, it, unless it's something that can be put in force and enacted eight years from now when these counts are done for, you know, whether or not we meet the 70, you know, when 75% of the community is full and we count the cars and we're over the limit, then I just can't see that happening eight years from now. Maybe it's doable. And if it is doable, I'd like to see the, you know, the wording of how all that could be done. Because if connectivity, I think, is a good thing, but in, in, I think it's different for every, for every neighborhood. So I think I would be inclined right now, unless there's some foolproof way to enact what Goral Palmer has suggested in wording, that we should consider a safety, a, a gate, even though it's against town policy and all the other things. So, okay, that's my. Anybody else, Jack? I uh, I would agree with what John said and make it even a stronger statement about it. Um, I think the neighbors are concerned about preserving um, the sense of neighborhood they now have and neighborhood integrity. In some, in some ways, neighborhood integrity versus neighborhood connectivity are playing off against each other here. Um, and I think that it's not strictly an engineering problem. It's partly a problem of preserving the neighborhood feel that they currently have. Um, someone pointed out, and we do listen to all of your comments. We read all of your emails. Um, someone pointed out some time ago that even Mr. McFarland's real estate agency, when he advertises a house on a dead-end street, he advertises on a dead end street because that is seen as an asset. And the people who currently live in this neighborhood certainly see that as an asset, and that's what they want to preserve. And I respect that, and I, I really feel the gate is a, is a good solution uh, to that problem. Uh, I'd like to add one more comment. Um, we've had a tremendous volume of emails from the neighborhood, some people outside the neighborhood too. Um, we do get all the emails, Maureen forwards them all to us, and I'm sure we all read them. We read them with a great deal of care. Recently, there's been a sense of frustration come across in some emails. Um, and the sense of frustration seems to me to partially be due to the fact that you're not, you're not hearing from us. You're writing to us, sending us emails in large numbers, you're not hearing from us. There's a reason for that. We are different from town councillors. You can have a dialogue with the town councillor about any issue that concerns you. You cannot have a dialogue with the planning board member or a zoning board member except at an official public hearing. Our status as board members is different from the town councillors. It's called quasi-judicial, and so we cannot have conversations with you outside of official public hearings. So please don't think that we're not hearing you, they're not reading what you have to say, because we are hearing you, and we care very much what you have to say, but we cannot engage in a dialogue except at open public hearing. Okay, thanks, Jack. Peter? I'm, I'm glad the non-lawyer explained that. <laughs> 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 you did a good job, Jack. Thanks. thanks. Um, I, certainly, I think the gate needs to be, you know, as, as we lawyers say, fully briefed. I mean, we want to hear from all sides on all the issues on it. Um, 
My inclination is against it, but I could be persuaded. I think the applicant's offer to, you know, uh, consider it in the future if, in fact, it turns out to be a problem. And I don't know how to uh, parameterize the problem, meaning just determine what's, where's the cutoff. That may be the problem John's talking about, is how do you figure that out now? Uh, but I want to hear from everybody on it. I mean, I've, as Jack said, we, we, we read all the emails. We, we, we're trying to digest a, an awful lot of issues here. And a lot of awful lot of opinions, an awful lot of frustration, but uh, I'm, I'm not inclined to it. But I, it, I'm still very, very open-minded on one way or the other, and I, and I do appreciate the applicant's offer. So clearly, I think we need to hear from the gate, the people, both sides on the gates <coughs> issue, and, and town staff in more detailed opinion about why they have issues with the gates. Barbara. Um, certainly, gates are number one with the abutters. And I listen very hard to what the abutters say, as well as to what the developers have submitted to us. Uh, I, I have a question about the gate, and that is, does putting in a gate negate meeting the requirement about the 2,000 feet mooring? No, you can still meet it. Okay. Well, since everybody's in favor of the gate, I certainly would vote for the gate. And I think it does another thing that nobody else has mentioned. I have been very concerned, not just with Mitchell Highlands. You're much more vocal than the other side is because there are more of you, and you may just be more vocal people. Um, <laughs> but the traffic on the, McDer on the Dermot Street side is going to be horrible for those people, much worse than it is for the Mitchell Highlands people. And I think that a gate would separate the amount of traffic going one way from the amount of traffic going the other way. So in my mind, in that way, it is positive. I am vehemently opposed to waiting to do anything. I think that means it would never get done. And I think when you go back four years after the fact and try to get somebody to do something, you're fighting a really losing battle. I think we need to make the decisions now about what's going to happen. Okay. Thank you. Paul? My opinion is, is that gates are not traffic calming measures. I don't think that a gate is um, a wise choice given what our intended goal is of interconnectivity. Um, I do believe as a professional in the traffic field that there is good opportunity to use other traffic calming devices to achieve the goal that I think everybody is looking for. There are ser serious concerns that by building this road, people will come. I have faith that there is an opportunity, again, with good, with good planning, to perhaps achieve a win-win on both sides, um, with a win-win being that we have the interconnectivity for emergency access, uh, for folks to or reduce their trip, shorten the burden on other intersections, um, while at the same time keeping the level of traffic that Matt might pass through it at a reasonable level. Now that being said, reasonable level is something that I would expect if this project moves forward. I have an expectation that the level of traffic that might use this road would be of a reasonable amount. Now what if I'm wrong? What if we're all wrong? What if the professionals who have looked at this are wrong? Um, if we are, then I think certainly it is due diligence of this board to go back and correct that measure. And I know my planning board members here tonight have expressed concerns about doing things after the fact. Um, I'm fortunate that I live in the world where we do things like monitor um, um, developments after the fact, and I can say that it can be structured to work. So, for example, you could set a period of time after the roadway was built to go back and take a look at it and determine what amount of traffic, cut through traffic, is using that, and then again through some diligence determine what's a reasonable level, and yes, by all means, if we're wrong, and that the amount of traffic far exceeds expectations or calculations. And if that volume of traffic is affecting quality of life, 
then I think we do have a diligence to revisit that and see what else can be done and maybe that does lead us back to a gate. So my long-winded statement is no, I don't think a gate is a good traffic calming measure, but I don't think we can ever take our eyes off the fact that these are residential neighborhoods and I would not want to be wrong. I don't think we will be. I think there will be a small amount of traffic to pass through it. I think it will be a reasonable level. I think the ultimate goal is a good one to achieve of interconnectivity. Uh, but again, I, I do think that it, it would behoove us uh, to have a plan B if it is needed. David, if you had a chance to chime in. And, and you're welcome to say, I echo the comments of so-and-so, or um, speak on your own. A couple of, couple of comments. Uh, some of the people on this board know that I don't, uh, that, that I don't uh, believe in interconnectivity as it's as the standard in that town is right now. But <clears throat> nonetheless, um, uh, the other co other comment about the gate is that I don't think in this particular application that a gate would. Uh, stop the interconnectivity of the neighbors in this particular application because they, this type of a neighborhood people walk a lot and a gate isn't really going to hinder them from walking from one side of the gate to the other side of the gate to visit friends as it would if there was only a path through the woods to connect. So from, I'm not sure that I think that the gate is the proper solution to this problem right now, but as far as those that believe a gate is a solution, um, it isn't going to affect the connectivity as much as some people might think. Okay, thank you. Uh, I will echo most of the, or virtually all the comments of Paul. They were very well said. I'm inclined not to uh, be in favor of a, a safety gate. I agree, however, that if we are wrong, I would like there to be something built into the plan so that one could be installed a year, two years, whatever the appropriate timing is. Uh, I haven't really heard any of the traffic experts say that there is going to be a, a significant volume of cut through traffic. I just can't imagine a resident in the Mitchell Road area, if they decide they're going out to Route 77, is going to drive through this neighborhood. Uh, I also happen to live in a neighborhood, Broad Cove, uh, with all due respect to the original developer of that neighborhood, is not uh, a very solid uh, example of sound planning. Uh, if I want to drive from my home to the Two Lights area, I've got to go travel two miles to get out of Broad Cove onto 77, take a left onto Two Lights, and you know what? I'm about 100 yards from my house by the time I get down Two Lights Road. If I want to go to Shore Acres, Shore Acres neighborhood, instead of perhaps going up Ledgewood Lane, going through, getting onto the Shore Acres neighborhood. Again, I've got to completely go out of Broad Cove Road, take a right onto 77, or right onto Old Ocean House Road, or right into the Shore Acres neighborhood. And again, uh, you know, as a bird flies, uh, I haven't really gone very far, but as the car drives, it's about a three mile trip. I don't think that connecting these neighborhoods would have a huge impact on the amount of cut through traffic. I think what it does do is cut down on traffic and from a planning standpoint, I would not be in favor of a gate. However, I understand where the neighbors are coming from, and if we are going to approve this project without a gate, I would want to build something in so that if we're wrong, we can address it and have specific parameters so it's relatively black and white. Um, any other thoughts on the safety gate issue? It's for the residents of the neighborhood and the applicant, it seems like there's a fairly even division on this point, so I think that will be a topic uh, that will have to be uh, thoroughly addressed at the, at the public hearing. Um, the next traffic uh, calming measure that, that is at least outlined in the town planner's memorandum are stop signs. Mm -mm. Uh, that, I'm going by the memo. I, I think stop signs might have been the third choice of the residents, mm -hmm. but, but I'm just going to follow the, Maureen's memorandum. Uh, Planning board members care to chime in on the installation of stop signs as a traffic calming measure in these neighborhoods. Well, clearly they're going to go in. The question is where and how many total do we want? And I, clearly I think we as a board are going to have to hear from everybody on where they're proposed, you know, what effect they're going to have and, you know, one, two, three, four, I think I heard the developer outline. Um, <clears throat> 
you know, what effect they're going to have. So I don't. I, I don't know how else to. <laughs> Fair enough. I don't think that. that there's going to be a, anybody on the board saying they don't want any stop signs. Um, but does anybody want to speak on that issue? I'd like to make a comment ahead, on the issue. Jack, I sure. mean, I uh, I live in a actually a street that's dead end street. Um, but at the midway point in that street, there's a, another street that crosses it, Eastfield, where Eastfield meets Highview and then it crosses it going down People's Cove. And there's a stop sign there on Eastfield Road, and, and no one pays attention to it. And I, and I think the stop signs in these quiet neighborhoods, there's no enforcement. I mean, it's, I would guess that maybe 30% of the people who come to that stop sign actually stop. And 7%, they, pro they probably feel like careful, they slow down, and they look, it's a quiet intersection. But the stop sign is basically ignored by the majority of people. Uh, and I think the comment by the traffic engineer uh, rings true that the more stop signs you put in, the greater the chance they get ignored. And so I, I think if you have one or two or maybe three key points that are obviously uh, danger points, then, traffic, then stop signs make sense. But, uh, you do have to be concerned that uh, people do tend to ignore stop signs when they either see too many, uh, when they're in locations which really don't require them. Okay, Paul. Well said, Jack. Again, my opinion is that stop signs should be used only when warranted, and there are very clear outlines when stop signs sh should be used. Uh, for example, stop sign at Chicory Way when it intersects South Street. That's a warranted location. You don't want traffic coming from Chicory up to South Street not to have some sort of a control so that it, it could potentially conflict with, with, with through traffic. But I am opposed to stop signs as a traffic control measure where they're not warranted. Um, studies have shown that where there are too many stop signs, Jack pointed out appropriately, people tend to ignore them. People tend to actually drive faster between them. Um, again, I, I'm concerned that the, the, they being used as measures to slow traffic down may not ultimately achieve that goal. So again, I, I'm, in, I'm in favor of uh, many of them that are designed appropriately as part of the plans, uh, but certainly not with the current plan that shows some three-way stops out in Columbus because I don't believe it, it achieves the objective that we're, that, we're tr that we're trying to accomplish. Any other comments on stop signs? I, mean, I also echo the concerns raised by Paul and Jack that we just have to be careful that we're not placing too many of these because they, they can then be ignored and then obviously are not effective traffic calming devices. Sidewalks and tree plantings. Barbara. I would like to say that, and I just have to say this, you're not going to like it, but I'm going to say it anyway. When I look at what happened at the meeting and what the developers decided to do in terms of traffic, I'm not happy. And the reason I'm not happy is because you stuck in one sign that wasn't there, one stop sign that wasn't there in the first place, and you added trees, which nobody really wanted. So I don't know whether you weren't listening or what you were thinking, but even people said, we don't want trees because you're going to put in these deciduous trees and all the leaves are going to fall down and we're going to have to clean them up and it's going to muck up our drainage areas. And so I'd like to say that I'm sort of disappointed with your remedies. As far as a sidewalk and an esplanade, perhaps with maybe conifer trees that don't shed their leaves and stay green all year round, that to me seems like a rational kind of a solution, perhaps on one side of Columbus Road. Um, we have to talk about the other side separately, but uh, it seems to me that would be safe for children for walking and biking and, and having an area where you, so that the road itself could be narrowed, which according to the traffic engineers, that is one way to get traffic to slow down. So I would definitely be in favor of a sidewalk on one side of Columbus Road and an esplanade with some kind of non-shedding trees in it. Anybody else want to weigh in on the sidewalks? Uh, I, I think I said at the very first workshop we held on this project that it, it would appear to me that the installation of a sidewalk for the length of Columbus Road would be a very effective traffic calming device. Uh, I obviously was interested in what the neighbors had to say, the neighbors in that area had to say about it, 
but I remain uh, convinced that that would be an effective traffic calming device. What kind of trees are placed in the esplanade, I guess we can discuss further on. Uh, I, I, I believe, though, that there ought to be trees planted in the esplanade. We have had study after study tell us that uh, trees alongside a road do tend to slow traffic down. Uh, so I would definitely be in favor of that, and I understand the applicant is concerned about costs. It's certainly a valid that they, that, that they are concerned about it, but given the, the impact on the neighborhood, I would be inclined to, to require that they in, incur that cost. Anything else on? I'll stay, I agree with what you just said. Without and, me. and to echo Jack's comment on the stop signs, if stop signs aren't necessarily going to be the most three-way stop sign and Columbus Road may not be effective, all the more reason to have uh, sidewalks uh, in place. I guess I had a question for Maureen. It, the, the current width of Columbus, does it allow you to just add sidewalk, or do you have to now make changes to 20 properties along one side? There's enough, you wouldn't have to take any land. The, the Columbus Road sits in a 50-foot wide right-of-way, so there is enough room within the right-of-way to, to construct the sidewalk. However, a portion of the right-of-way is considered to be people's front yards. And when you say that they don't own it, but they just <laughs> treated it as their yes. own, which is understandable because lawns usually go to the side of the road. Okay. I think that may, if we assume we agree on a site walk, we want to take a look at the impact that sidewalks would have along Columbus Road. Um, and we'll get to the issue of a site walk after we talk, finish our discussion here tonight. Um, does anybody care to address any of the other traffic calming measures uh, for this side of the neighborhood? There were chicanes, uh, speed bumps, raised crosswalks, et cetera. Uh, it seems like they've essentially fallen to the bottom of the list, but if about residents of these neighborhoods are advocating them, uh, and we've missed it somehow, please send us an email to remind us of that. Okay, what about uh, Stevenson Street? Again, that neighborhood was also in favor of an emergency access gate. We've already addressed that issue. Uh, what about the construction of South Street? Barbara. I've always liked that idea and Stevenson. However, I don't think the developers should have to bear the entire burden of that. I think if that becomes a possibility that everybody along those two streets should share equally in the cost of that um, improvement because everybody's property will go up in value if you have a nice street in front of your house. And it would, it would divert some of the traffic. The problem comes when you get to Stevenson. And I've thought about that a lot, and I don't really see many solutions to that part of the problem. But it, if, um, if South Street and Stevenson were paved, it would benefit everyone. And I really think that should become a very major discussion. Oh, it's my problem. I mean, my concern about that particular item is that I'm not sure it's a traffic calming measure and I'm inclined to only require the uh, applicant uh, to implement something if it's going to calm traffic. Uh, so I'm not sure I see a connection between that, although it sounds like it would be a good idea, I would not be inclined to make that a requirement of this application. Uh, I don't know if I'm the minority here, but it might no, be helpful. I, I agree with that. It could make the traffic issue worse, in fact. I, I, I concur with your thoughts, David. Yep. Okay. I just uh, want to say one more. Go ahead. I do see it as a traffic calming measure. Okay. Because I think you're taking traffic, all of the traffic that would go down Dermot, and I forgot the name of the other street. Yeah. Uh, and that's a huge, in Hamlin, that's a huge amount of traffic. That's the worst part of it, by the traffic studies. And at least you'd have 
two different ways that people would go out. So everybody wouldn't be coming out the same way. I mean, some people go straight, some people make a left. And I think it would be a traffic calming measure, so I don't agree. I respectfully disagree. Fair enough. <laughs> uh, does any member of the board wish to discuss this evening any of the other traffic calming measures that were either raised by the residents of these neighborhoods or by the applicant or by us? Okay. Go ahead, Barbara. I have a question. Sure. And that is, um, the question is Stevenson and Spurwing. And I really think some consideration, I don't know what the answer is. I don't see any answers really, Paul, for you. Um, what kind of answers? I mean, I've read all the traffic studies and everything, and we're talking about a three-way stop sign, and maybe that's the only thing that can be done in that area. I don't know. But Just, that's a real concern, because a lot of people are going to be coming out through that. That's the only exit there. Yeah. I mean, clearly there are, there are things that need to be done to Steve, the intersection of Stevenson and Spur Week in order to, you know, take care of sight distance and, and, and potential safety issues. Um, so again, I, 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 I'm, I'm with you on that, Barbara. I think, I think that needs to be addressed. Um, I, I, and I, th I, I think, well, we, we will make sure that it is as, as part of this process. But what kind of solutions are there? I mean, I think well, I mean, we're going to need to improve sight distance. We're going to need to do things to warn folks about the intersection and the fact that there's now going to be increased volume of traffic through it. You know, can the intersection handle the capacity? Yes, it can, but I think diligence would show that we need to provide some type of, you know, additional, um, you know, warning signs, warning devices, so that people are aware of the traffic coming in and out of that location. It's, it's, it's on a quarter. I mean, it's obviously it wouldn't be what you do if you were planning it from scratch today, but again, I think with proper uh, sight distance improvements and with some warning signs, I think it can, accommodate, I can, it can handle what it's, what it's being asked to do. And assuming we proceed with a site walk, I, I do recall that there is a proposal to deal with that uh, intersection, which would involve a three-way stop. Yep. I think some advanced signage. Yep. I recall the discussion of a flashing light and very little, little in the way of uh, altering the right of way in there as far as existing trees or bushes. But perhaps we could focus on that issue when, if we go back out to the neighborhood. Yeah, I think we also better talk to the neighbors about a flashing light. I'm not sure how great they're going to feel about that. Mm. I wouldn't fair. want to live in an area where a light flashed in my eyes all the time. Yep, F fair enough. Um, any other comments or questions on traffic? issues. Okay. Um, yeah, I'd like, I'd like to make one final comment. Sure. Well, it's a little bit repetitive, but um, I think we have a situation here where the neighbors have really spoken with a unanimous voice. And, and you know, around them we have this discussion going on that's somewhat technical in nature, traffic engineer studies and so forth and so on. But the neighbors have spoken unanimously about what they want. What they want is a solution to the problem. I, I think we really ought to give some particular weight to that as far as making the decision. Second that. Okay. Thanks, Jack. Uh, we have also received a number, of, moving on, unless someone tells me not to, uh, we've received a lot of requests from uh, people that live near the proposed development for buffering. And I had asked before tonight's meeting the town planner to summarize those so that we could make sure that we didn't miss any of them. And we could also uh, perhaps get a sense from the applicant, maybe even this evening, as to what they might be willing to consider. Uh, and I point the board members to a, a, a large sheet of paper, second to last sheet of paper in, this, in the package we got from the town planner. And there appear to be uh, Numbers 1 through 33, are the, do these refer to just comments we received, or are these house numbers? No, I just put numbers there in case you wanted to refer to letter number 15. Fair enough. And the, what's in bold, are those the requests then for buffering that you were able to gather from the emails? Yeah, those are, those are property specific. Okay. The other comments were more generic to the development, but those were comments that were requested by individual property owners for their property. Okay, uh, and, and maybe tonight is not the right time to do this. 
Uh, so I'd certainly be willing to take input from the board. One thing I'd contemplated is if we have another site walk, we visit each of the residents' properties who have requested buffering, take a look at what it is they want to see happen or what their concerns are, and then we can also have the applicant there to talk about whether that's something they'd be willing to do or not. And we could also get a sense of whether we are, would require that or not. Um, would anybody like to talk about these requests tonight? David? No, I, I think your approach is the proper way to do it. I, I think having a site walk to visit the site would be better for me to understand what they want. OK. Is that agreeable to everyone? Yeah. Uh, also, I'd like to ahead. make the suggestion that you tell your neighbors, because there aren't that many of you here now, that and maybe, maybe we could could, perhaps we could put this in the notice, Maureen, that we're going to do this. Because if there's someone who's going to be out of town, they could leave a written letter or something with a neighbor that says, you know, we would really like fir trees or we'd like a six-foot fence, a stockade fence, or what their preference would be. So we could kind of put everything together and, and make some rational decisions about it. Because everybody may not be able to be there, and there may be somebody who really has strong feelings about it. Sure. I haven't heard any member of the planning board say that a, another site walk is not wise here. I'm getting the sense that everyone's in agreement that we should have one. Absolutely. OK. Uh, I would like, though, to focus our energies during the site walk on some of these specific issues so that if, if you are uh, someone who lives in this area that, that has made a specific request, we would like to visit you during the course of our site walk uh, and I don't know what the best way to get the word out would be, but I suspect this could be a fairly lengthy site walk. Um, I'd suggest that we start early on a Saturday morning. Uh, I have kids, so I get up rather early, but um, uh, you know, we could start at 8 and continue most of the morning. Uh, and uh, what might be helpful is Maureen and I could talk on the phone or by email and kind of come up with a general plan of attack. And in addition to the abutters who have requested buffering, I would like to visit some of the areas involved in the traffic calming measures. So that would be the length of Columbus Road, uh, walk, walk along that area, perhaps the, uh, the intersection of Spurwink and Stevenson, uh, the area where the Stevenson folks would like to see a, a, a speed table, et cetera, so we can view these things again firsthand. Does that sound like a reasonable plan? Very. I think we should also give the, the P, I mean, there, there's correspondence has mainly come from, you know, there's 30 or 40 people that have been writing on a regular basis. And I think that it should be, you know, some of the things that we look at should be weighted more toward the people that have, you know, continue to show a lot of interest in what we, you know, the, this discussion. Um, I'll, I'll leave it at that. Um. <laughs> I have heard from, in some of the emails, that some residents uh, in the, is it the Macaulay, yes, yeah, the Macaulay Road neighborhood may not be in a position due to family situations, et cetera, to tell us what they might like. Uh, to the extent you're able or willing to try to find out from those people what they would like, we're happy to hear from you as their uh, proxy. They would like to have some sort of confirmation, whether it's a note that that's what indeed they'd like to see. We wouldn't want to require the developer to install a fence along someone's backyard only to find out they didn't want it. But you know, I, I trust we can get that information to us uh, during the site walk and at the next hearing. Uh, go ahead, Barbara. We, could we also add on to that? There were a couple of people. Um, there's a gentleman who lives across from where Kildare, I can't remember his name right now, where Kildare and, and Chicory come into Columbus and, and was very concerned about lights coming into his... He's on that list. Which is also yeah, he's on that list, yeah. Okay. Yep. Right. Okay. So we need to set a date. The, uh, assuming we table this to the next public hearing, that's going to be uh, May 16th, so we need to do it between now and May 16th. I would say the earlier the better. We have a site walk this Saturday. What about the following Saturday, which is May 6th? 
Does that work for the applicant and its consultants? It's Mother's Day weekend. Oh, yeah. Mother's Day? No, it's following the following weekend's Mother's Day weekend. All our stakes have been taken on the cross. Six is, six is open for me. Okay. Yeah, I have a cross. Well, I don't have to be there, I suppose, but the cross games are a moving in the side. We're all going to run through that. I, I, unfortunately, I can't do Sunday. No, I don't think we should. I think we just start as early as we can on Saturday. Maybe starting at 7.30. I'm not here on the 6th. Oh, you're Sorry. Not, I'm out for a I week. get a 9.30. But it's going to be hard to hit everybody. Right. And if you can get six. I, you know. Can I have a show of hands as to who, who is available on May 6th at 8 o'clock? Well, I think I am. Okay. Right uh, now I am. I'm not sure how long, but yeah. Yeah. All right. <laughs> Same. Um, and for you? I got it. My only concern with May 13th is we're getting awfully close to the... I can't do it on May 13th, right. and I'm quite sure. Well, then it sounds like yeah. May 6th is better. And perhaps John with the town planner could arrange a time to go down and look at some of these issues during the week. If you're going to try to visit all these places. Yeah. yeah. We're going to be... Okay. Two hours seems ambitious to get this done, to be honest. Well, if you know how long you have, then you know how long you can stay at each place. That's true. All right. 7.30. How about 7.30 start? Some of the people might not be right to 7.30. I don't like it either. But. Uh, if we, what if we went from 7.30 to 10? Yeah, true. Right. No? Or, I did. or 8 to 10? 8. 7.30 to 10. 7.30 to 10. We're going to go as long as it takes, whatever. That's fine. We will we'll commit to that, and we will just need to keep in mind that it's two and a half hours and try to move along as efficiently as we can. So when are we starting? 7.30. You know, I, I, I truly think we can cover. Could I just get a nod from the, the butters? Is that ridiculous? No. Uh, you know. <laughs> Uh, I mean, yeah, they're there already. We have to get there. Well, we can we can walk the length of Columbus Road and not knock on people's doors. Yeah, that's, yeah. I mean, we, we can we can view the Columbus and yeah, intersections yeah. and then do the do the residences last. So we probably wouldn't come to folks individually till eight or eight thirty. Yeah. Excellent. <laughs> we'll go in there first. That'll be good. <laughs> I, I agree. We'll, I agree. We'll do our homework in advance. I don't think it'll take longer than two hours. All right. So it's 8 o'clock then, board members? 8 to 10? Yes. Change this. Okay. Thank you. For yeah, tell everybody to be prepared. Peter? Well, we, we, we do have, a, as right this lady in the back pointed out, we do have a pretty good idea of what folks are interested in. Uh, for their own individual properties. To Jan, that's the most. <laughs> all right. Uh, I think that's all that I wanted to try to cover after the applicant's presentation. Is there anything else that any member of the board would wishes to raise right now? We'll get the stormwater plan next time. So we Storm, have... Yes, that's right. I, John? I, are we allowed to talk about phasing? Is that something that you can, that we can? Yeah. Sure. Um, I understand that, that um, you, you don't quite know the start date, <laughs> but is there some idea of, you know, fa how long each phase takes? That's good. Yeah, it's a, it's a function of sales, I guess. Uh, I mean, we're definitely going to start with... Um, uh, what we proposed is phase one, which would include, uh, you know, these, these single-family lots right here. Okay, and so then phase two wouldn't happen until a certain percentage of those have been sold or... That's right, and, and uh, what we have in the application, we have requested that we are not required to uh, do phase two and phase three in that sequence. If, for instance, they decide they want to, after phase one, move over to the phase three, that they would be allowed to do that. 
Okay. Is it, then this is a question for the town planner. Is there something that says that, that it can't be 20 years before phase two starts? Or You know, the, over the years we've had this conversation more than once, and you really have two ways to go. In some places, uh, you get uh, an applicant a long time frame in order to record their plan, because after they record their plan, they have to start within a certain number of days. Um, in other places, you want that plan recorded as soon as possible, so anyone nearby who wants to buy property is on, has the chance to know that something's supposed to happen. But then you give them a long period of time on whenever they're going to start. And we're in the second category. So we require the applicant to record their plan within 90 days, and we usually don't require a start date. Usually usually don't is that something who I don't ever remember us requiring a start date and you know the reality is that even if you did um, you have to ask yourself the question if a developer is not at that particular moment in time financially able to start the project do you really want them to go out there and make a mess and, and then go bankrupt yeah. so then what I mean, was there, do you have a concern the other way? Well, I, I guess I, I, well, yeah, that, that wasn't going to go on for, I mean, we're talking to the neighbors here, that it doesn't go on forever. That or, they wouldn't have trucks that there's some, the neighbors exactly. for the next 20 years. Exactly. Then I had okay. one other question about, sorry. Can we let the applicant? Yeah, sorry. Well, I'm sorry. Hi, I'm, I'm Craig Cooper, one of the applicants. <laughs> I mean, we would have every desire to start as soon as possible, and based on sales, et cetera, we'd like to complete this project as soon as possible. And uh, that's our, been our firm belief and desire from day one. So we, we would not want this to go on any longer than necessary. And that's one of the reasons that we requested the ability to go from phase one to phase three. If the sales of the condominiums become more than the single family homes, then we can move over there and complete that part of the project as well. There's no, there's no desire to drag this on any longer, and if sales are good, we would be expecting a complete build-out phase to be between three and five years. Do you have another question? I did, and it has to do with when the town should, expect, should accept the open space, and who decides that. The, the applicant, well, when you have a phase project and you have open space, um, you want at least an amount of open space that goes with that phase of the project, but we don't divide open space up among the individual units, so it becomes a little complicated. Um, so what we've asked the applicant to do, just to keep it clean, is to give us all the open space as part of phase one. Okay. Paul? A couple of things, David, if I can. Um, Maureen, in your letter, um, noted that the, the applicant has eliminated the proposed improvements to the Columbus Mitchell intersection of the recommendation of the town manager. Um, I don't recall seeing any, I didn't, don't recall seeing a letter from, from Mike on that, and I guess I'd just like to understand why, and um, I probably want to follow up on that. Okay. Uh, second, and then John, maybe you can help me. Um, I have a note in my list of comments. I think there's a note in the plans um, that talks about the removal of the raised crosswalk yes. at the request of the town. There is. Um, I, I guess I'm, well, that's something I'm going to suggest it is not, it would be removed until we figure out exactly where we're going with this, because uh, that would not be my recommendation at this point. I'm not sure where I'm going to want to get in. Well, if the planning board recommends traffic calming devices, um, does the town have the authority to supersede our decision and have them removed. Where is it? Uh, John, you remember where that was? Within their project? Yeah, so I believe it specifically talks about the race crosswalk that is on South Street. It's on, it's on sheet two. Sheet two. Note, uh, note five. Yes, yeah, uh, note number five, the applicant shall modify and remove the raised cross rock if requested by the public works director. And I guess my, my overriding question is, is if the planning board approves this project with a raised crosswalk, 
Um, does the town have the right to remove it if this note stays? Ooh. The raised crosswalk? Yeah. Any, once the planning board approves a plan, any amendment to the plan has to come back to the planning board. Okay. So. But, but even, once, once even, the even, town accepts the road. After they accept the road and they remove if they remove it, I don't see how you could ever hold the developer. No, no, it's, I mean, legally, mm. you, have, you have the grounds for it. Um, practically, probably not. Okay. John, can you just show me on the, on the, the plan, maybe right there? You're right, sir. Okay, sir. It's, it's South Street and Franklin Circle. Yep. Okay. When was that added? It was added in the latest round, so somebody has suggested that that note be added. Uh, again, my point is, is that if this board decides that it's a raised crosswalk is appropriate, uh, I'm wondering under what grounds can it be removed? Well, I think we should have it stricken if we think it's appropriate. I have this note stricken. I mean, again, traffic calming is still up for debate. I mean, I'm, in, I'm in, personally, I'm in favor of this, this raised crosswalk is being a traffic calming device that uh, spot. at that spot. So I guess I'm not inclined to think about somebody ultimately having the ability to take this out because it would have an effect on, you know, theoretically has an effect on cut through traffic. I agree but once, once, once it's in, the project's done, developer dedicates, they're, they're gone. But the, the, the town owns the street, the town maintains the street, the town maintains the crosswalk, the town takes out the crosswalk, the town takes out stop signs, the town puts in stop signs. Yep. And we could add the town could late, later take out some of these or put some or add some more if it decided some other intersections needed. Yep. Go ahead. Um, town council, correct? Right. I, I, it's occurring, and this was approved before I was hired. Um, but the, <laughs> the Elizabeth Farm subdivision, I believe, was a private road that had a um, stone dust path adjacent to the roadway. And um, the property owners decided they wanted the town to take over the road as a public road. And I believe when they upgraded the road to meet town standards, they eliminated the paved pathway. And that was done without coming back to the planning board for any kind of approval. Okay. So I think that answers. Because the town at that point owns the right of way. Right? They didn't. Oh, that was part of the condition of acceptance. Well, that's interesting. Okay. Something all over. Okay. Do you want to speak to her before we get to Jack and Maureen? You, Maureen? you had asked, I don't have the letter in this file. I actually have four different files in this project right now, and I can get a copy of that to you. If we could do that prior to the site walk, that would be yes. great. Thank you. Jack? Maureen had a question that I'm probably the other one to answer. Uh, the issue brought up by the lady who spoke tonight about the wetlands adjacent to this condominium or the site. Is that something we should look at in the site walk, whether the, the drainage from the condominium here affects that wetlands? Um, I believe, and, and I hope the applicant can answer this as well, I believe when the original wetlands analysis was done by the applicant that you verified that there were no RP1 wetlands within 250 feet of the boundary of the property. That's correct. Okay. If this is not an RP1 wetland, it would be an RP2 wetland, and the, the town doesn't regulate any activities outside of RP2 wetlands. I'm sorry, what, what did the board decide about the raised crosswalk note? I, I don't think we have yet. To be determined. Yeah. I, think, I think we want to find out what the source of the... Okay. Well, and it sounds to me like it doesn't really matter whether you take the note out because when, when I'm one, gathering from the town planners. Yeah, because once, once the, they turn the road over to the town, it's the town's road. The applicant is, is, does not have any responsibility for it. I think the developer's concern is, what am I building? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I and right now the, the answer is, we don't know yet. <laughs> I, I, from what I'm gathering, I think the planning board is in favor of the raised crosswalks in the Franklin Circle South Street intersection. I think it's just a question of whether that Note 5 ought to remain in the plans or not. Right, but it does sound like the planning director, I mean the uh, public work director was the one that asked that it be removed. Is that right? And I just, I would like to know why, just so I understand what the rationale well, is. Um, as, as the board probably remembers, there was um, pretty unanimous opposition from town staff to a variety of traffic calming issues, and this was just one of them. I would be inclined to take out Note 5. I think that they ought to be built, and then 
down the road, the town council or whomever is the appropriate regulatory authority says they come out, then they come out. But I, I, I don't want to make it that easy that the, the public works director can just request it and then it's gone. And maybe that's how it works anyway, but I'd be inclined to take out. No, I, I, well, generally, I, I agree with you. I just want to hear what his rationale is first. You know, the town council passed an emergency resolution that made sure that we knew that we didn't have to be guided by public works director or any other town staff advice. That's right. Uh, Barbara. I don't think we need to wait. I think we should ask for it to come out. This is our decision, and if after the town's voted, if the, once the road goes to the town, then it's not our decision anymore. But I agree it shouldn't be that easy, and I agree that I think we should just get it out of here, get I, it out I, of the plans. And the only reason I hesitate on that, Barbara, at this point is we're considering traffic calming devices as a whole. When you bring it all together, the stop signs, the raised crosswalk, the esplanade, the sidewalk, everything. And I'm not inclined to take it out or put it in right now. I just want to, I'm glad Paul pointed it out because I assumed it was still there. Um, but I, I guess right now I don't want to ask the developer to do anything until I get sort of a fuller hearing on it from the public's work director. I want to hear what his thinking is. Maybe we'll disagree with it, maybe we'll agree with it. And then we'll make a decision when we get the whole traffic calming picture puzzled together. Gate, the whole nine yards. I want to hear it all next time. And at the site. I'm just a little uncomfortable that this is sort of the backwards way of Well, that's why we all read the plans. <laughs> no, no, backwards in the sense that we're letting a staff member come in and make an alteration to a plan after the fact without us saying we want to incorporate all that that staff member has said because maybe you open the door to some problems that we could have in the future. But I'll defer to you. Uh, the town planner has a question. Um, to, to Planning Board Member Schenkel, you had mentioned stormwater. Um, I was just wanted for the applicant's benefit what you expected to hear about stormwater at next month's meeting, whether you wanted a full presentation of that or are you just looking for comments from the town engineer or? Well, I think there's some discrepancy between or dis not complete agreement between what um, the if Goral Palmer said about stormwater management and some of Butters hired DeLuca, and I think they need to just be reconciled. And I think that the applicant should explain that. And I'd also like a comment from Steve Harding about what his opinion is as the town engineer. I think we ought to look at the whole thing. And the other thing I'd, I'd like to take when we're at the site, one more look at, is there's an area that crosses over, could cross over to some Butters that was very, very wet. Um, as you came up South Street, and I think we should remember to look at that again when we're on the sidewalk, just to be sure that there aren't going to be problems there. Okay, and Maureen tells me we'll be going that way because yeah. some of the folks that live near there are buffering. That's fine. Okay, any? Where are we going to meet? Well, that's a good question. Um, uh, I mean, it might make sense. Are most of the specific requests for buffering, wh which side of the neighborhood are, are most of the requests? Most of them are on Columbus Road. Right? Yeah, Columbus well, Road. Right. The opposite of where we met the last time. You may want to. No, the buffering is all along South Street at the intersection of Columbus. Ah. So spend time on both You'll sides. I'm not sure that. that way you can okay. get down this way and then you can move up here. Where's the, where's the better is, parking? <laughs> the town planner has suggested that we meet at the intersection of Columbus and Kildeer Road. I apologize in advance to those residents. We'll, we'll be parking on the roadways. Is it? It's in the right of way. <laughs> okay, we, we're talking about the. I, I'm sorry, Second. you're right. I was looking at the, the one furthest in. Uh, and we'll see the car. So. Is that all right with the app? I don't know what time. What time did you? Any, what? what time are we meeting? It's 8 o'clock. Yeah. 8. Uh, Jim just offered, uh, what about parking at Columbus and Mitchell? Because it's town on land right it's there. It's town on land that you wouldn't be parking in front of neighbors. And just start going all the way down Columbus and then into the subdivision and go out the other side. Where is that? Columbus and Mitchell. It's a piece of town on land. Oh, I know. 
on the street. All the way out of Columbus and Mitchell? Well, you got to start at that intersection and just talk about sidewalks all the way down. So you might and just walk on to instead of starting in the middle, then you have to go both ways. Well, that makes and then sense. walk along the South Street where the yeah. others are. Okay. Where is the parking? I guess where do we where do we park? Where do we park there? There's a, the town owns that piece right at the uh, at the corner of Mitchell Road it's in Columbus. There's a town park right there. Yeah, it's a park. It's woods. Oh, you can park right. That means right. wide enough to park. Yeah. Right here, David. All along there. That's, I mean, that, that's fine with me. It might make our walk a little bit longer on Columbus Road, but I think we want to look at the, right. the sidewalk issues and other issues on Columbus Road anyway. Okay. Uh, so we'll meet then in that park area uh, off of the Columbus Road, Mitchell Road intersection. So you go down, you take a left, or depending where you're coming from, you go down Columbus Road a little bit, and it's on your left? Yes. Okay. 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 Uh, we still have not had a motion regarding a public hearing, unless there's anything else. Uh, uh, David, did you want to say anything else? No, I was just going to go ahead. It's further ordered that the above application be tabled to the regular May 16, 2006 meeting of the planning board and that a scheduled site walk be held on the 6th of May at 8 o'clock. Are we hand it? At, oh, go ahead. Are we setting a public hearing at the oh, 16th? Motion's hearing. been made. Go ahead. Are you adding that the public hearing will also public, be held? The, uh, public hearing would also be made at the May 16th meeting. Okay, so we have a motion. The application be tabled to May 16, 2006, at which time a public hearing shall be held and that we shall have a site walk on May 6th at 8 a.m. Is there a second? Second. Any further discussion? All those in favor? A motion carries. Uh, I believe that concludes the items on the agenda for this evening. Do we have a motion to adjourn? Actually, I have one question on this letter, and I know that uh, Avon Road. We, we thought we would take that up after, after the. Uh, I just okay. Fair enough. I don't mind asking you while people are funneling out. It has nothing to do with Sproink Woods. Yeah, there is another agenda item that does not relate to Sproink Woods that we may discuss briefly. I just, Maureen, just a quick question about the what what the dispute is because I looked at the pictures real quick. Um, is there a question as to whether that tree that was removed was necessary for the driveway that we allowed him to put in? And, and just very briefly, just so we're clear for the record, Go ahead. we are discussing uh, the 5 Avon Road approval that was granted in which month? It was either March or the April public. Right. Hearing. And there was a communication that we all received from the public and was forwarded to staff, right? right? And what happened was that a tree that was located in the public right of way was right. removed. Right. And you're not supposed to cut down town trees without permission. Right. So um, the town went out there, verified that in fact it was in the right of way. Um, the applicant apologized. Um, however, also provided information that um, might have gotten permission from the town to remove the tree anyway. Sure. Oh, wait, that decision was never made. Pardon? The applicant also provided information that might have gotten permission from the town to remove the tree anyway. Would, but you, that decision was never made. Can you elaborate on that? It was if the tree is diseased right. or dying, sure. or if the tree is in the place where you're going to put your driveway, you might be able to get permission anyway right. to take the tree down, even though it's a tree in the public right of way. Sure. But the decision was never taken any further than that. Uh, the final conclusion was that the applicant was fined $2,000 uh, for removal of a tree without permission. And the money is going to be set aside and used for purchase of trees to be planted elsewhere in the town. He didn't. He didn't. Did he pay it or object or negotiate? Uh, my understanding is he's he's very contrite. Okay. Oh, to, to plant trees elsewhere it should be planted 
right there. No, the decision that the town made was that the money would be used to plant trees in the right of way of the town or on municipal property without a commitment to a particular place that they're going to be planted. He agreed to replace the tree as well with a less quality tree. So he'll replace the tree that was cut down. He agreed to do that in the letter that he sent. Just how do you? No, the letter from the developer? That's the letter. Hmm? Oh, I didn't see that yes, one. Yes, how do you? I didn't see if that. I could just I saw the one from the town. If I could just jump in, sure. I do believe this is an issue of enforcement. We approve a plan, we approve a project, but right. as far as enforcing it, that's really not our bailiwick. Thank you, and it, David. It, and it appears to me that the town has taken steps to deal with the situation. Whether we agree or disagree, I think is really not what about the other right for discussion. I agree, Where Dave. I just are... so the really from an agenda item, we don't need to bring this up again. Well, right. And to respond to Mrs. Schenkel's comment on the memorandum from Bruce Smith dated April 25th, the, the end of the first paragraph, Mr. Smith states, Mr. Pillsbury and I also walked the property to review his cutting of other trees on the lot itself. I agreed with him that he had taken only what was necessary for construction of the dwelling, and therefore I do not see an issue. Okay. That's fine. Okay. Uh, my understanding is that there are no issues on our agenda for the April, excuse me the May workshop. So we will not have a May workshop. Um, just for your information. So yeah, we'll have two site walks. So we'll be kept plenty busy. Um, any further business? Is there a motion to adjourn? I move to adjourn. Second. Second. All those in favor? Okay. Thank you. Well done. Yeah.